Okay, we're letting everybody in right now. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining ALS Canada today for our um, webinar on Respirology and ALS. And we have some guests that you can see on the screen. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of quick introductions and then we're going to hop right into it. Uh, a few housekeeping items I just want to let everybody know is that you're able to ask questions in the chat box and then we will have an opportunity to ask our panelists different questions. Um, if you have anything, please feel free to put it in there. Uh, if it's relevant to the point, we'll stop and ask the question. But if not, we'll hold all questions to the end, but we will make sure that everyone has an opportunity to get their questions answered. Uh, first, I'm going to do some quick introductions. So, Mary Lynn Ir Irwin, Ir Irvin, right? I said it right? Okay. Um, is a respiratory uh, therapist at the Ottawa Hospital Rehabilitation Center. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And Stephanie Gatta and Kim Poyer are both from um, ProRest in Ottawa and Kingston and are both also respiratory therapists. So thank you all three of you for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. We're going to hop right in with Stephanie and Kim doing their part of the presentation. So we're going to be sharing some um, uh, slides with you as we go along. So I'm just going to load them and then we're good to go. I just want to make sure if somebody could give me a heads up that they they can see it. That would be much appreciated. Can you guys see the screen? I can't. As a presenter, can you see the screen? No. Nope. Right. Okay, give me one second and I'm going to try this again. No one could see the screen, right? You're all no. shaking your head, but my problem is I couldn't hear you. Okay. Show screen. It was up and it was working fine, of course, before we get started. Uh, so I apologize to everyone for this because, you know, technology. Uh, waiting to view. Sharing. Maybe what we could do is have um, Stephanie and Kim. Maybe you could start chatting a little bit about your your stuff, and I'm going to look for the thing. I'm sorry, I apologize. It was all right here, and uh, sure. Do you want me to try to show my screen? We can't. Oh. We can't hear you, Stephanie. <clears throat> oh, goodness. We are having a lot of technical issues. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. OK. Um, do you want me to show my screen? That would be wonderful if you can show your screen. <laughs> OK, let's see if that works. On my end, I seem to be having a lot of technical issues getting things loaded and volumes and everything so I do apologize to everyone but we are going to get there there we go we can see your screen okay you guys can see this whoops Mm 
Okay, can you guys see uh, the presentation? And we just need it to be, um, we can see the next slide, so we just need the display settings changed. Okay. Perfect. Yep. This one? Uh, I think it's the second one. There we go. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so uh, respiratory therapists in the community, uh, what they do, so we do home visits for um, respiratory assessments and we assess respiratory equipment need as well. Um, so once the equipment is needed, we also educate the usage and maintenance and we monitor ongoing therapy. So we work really closely with the healthy team and the doctors. And we assess to make sure that all the settings and the therapy is optimal. And we also work with compliance and comfort. So we work with the family, we work with the patient um, to make sure that we can, uh, you know, try to, to uh, make the um, usage of the equipment as, as comfortable uh, as possible. Um, before we get into equipment, I want to explain a bit what um, assistive devices program is. So uh, often you'll hear ADP. And ADP is a program through the government of Ontario only. Um, so anybody who has a health card in Ontario can apply for this program. And it helps to cover cost of equipment, uh, a lot of equipment, not only respiratory, but it does include respiratory equipment as well. In some cases, um, the patient will also receive payments throughout the year to help cover the cost of certain supplies. So if you end up buying a suction unit, if you have a tracheostomy, um, they will help you to cover uh, cost of the supplies uh, to maintain um, the equipment. So we'll get right into uh, BiPAP therapy. So I just want to explain a bit the difference between a CPAP and a BiPAP. So a CPAP uh, stands for continuous positive airway pressure. And CPAP is prescribed to treat obstructive sleep apnea. CPAP is a machine that gives pressure. Uh, so it takes the air from the room. There's no added oxygen to it. And it's one constant pressure to keep the airway open while sleeping. The difference with BiPAP, BiPAP stands for bi-level positive airway pressure, and it's two pressures. So you have an uh, inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure. So when you take a breath in, it gives you a pressure. And when you exhale, it's a different pressure. And we'll go a bit more in details. Um, so this here, um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what a BiPAP looks like. Here in Ontario, um, those are the two units that you'll see um, the most. So the one on the left is called a Stellar, and the one on the right is the newer one called the Air Curve. Um, so um, those would be the units that you would see um, if you are prescribed a BiPAP. So BiPAP therapy um, gives two pressures and often uh, a BiPAP that's prescribed for an ALS patient will also have a backup respiratory rate. So a BiPAP unit, what it does, um, it will help, um, it will provide ventilation for non-dependent spontaneous breathing patients, meaning that you will still be able to take a breath, um, but it will assist your breathing. And uh, it's for patient with respiratory, um, if the breath is insufficient, insufficient, I can't say that word, sorry, insufficient, or if in a respiratory failure, and with or without obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so it can also help uh, if sleep apnea is also uh, something that you have. Um, the guidelines to start BiPAP therapy, our next speaker, Mary, will go a bit more in details in regards to that, because um, the, uh, the doctor and the health team will start the process um, into testing if BiPAP therapy is needed. Home care respiratory therapists, where we come to help to assist if BiPAP therapy is needed, is we perform an overnight oximetry and that will test your oxygen saturation while you're sleeping, so your oxygen level. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it's just a probe that we put on the finger while you're sleeping, 
and this records and then it comes back to us and we print a report and we send it to the health team and we can um, assess if BiPAP is needed. So that's one of the tests we can do. Mary will explain a bit more um, what else, uh, what other tests are involved into assessing BiPAP therapy. So BiPAP therapy is not only for overnight, but can also assist breathing during the, the day. So overnight, what it does is it actually makes the sleep more restful because it will increase, it will help assist the breathing. So you're not um, using as much energy and uh, will help with the sleep quality so that during the day, you actually have more energy during the day. You can also use it during the day, um, which will assist with your breathing. Um, so you will use less effort and be able to take bigger breaths. Same thing, it will help you uh, save energy and not feel as tired during the day as well. So BiPAP therapy, um, we, um, your doctor, your health team, and uh, your respiratory therapist at home will probably recommend and will say that a full face mask is preferred. Um, the reason why it's not that we want you not to be comfortable is just we want the therapy to be as beneficial as possible. So you might be able to only breathe through your nose and the nasal mask might work, but it might not work for very long. What happens with ALS is often um, it will turn into bulbar, which means that your muscle and your jaw will weaken and you won't be able to keep your mouth closed throughout the night. Uh, if the mouth is open, the therapy is not as beneficial. Um, so that's the reason why that you might be right from the start uh, recommend, uh, recommended to go with a full face mask. Now, there's a lot of different full face masks um, and we try definitely to find the one that's the most comfortable for you and that will fit um, the best for you. So you can see on the left here, there's the mask that covers the nose and the mouth. But with BiPAP therapy, often um, we will also recommend the one on the right, which is called a hybrid mask. And that one goes under the nose. You can still breathe through your nose and also covers the mask. Um, a lot easier as well if you have glasses and stuff like that. But if someone wears BiPAP for a long period of time, it will also help so that uh, you don't get irritation on the top, on the bridge of the nose. Uh, funding for BiPAP machines. So like I mentioned, most BiPAP units for ALS patient will have a backup rate. Um, in Ontario, um, these units are covered 100% through the assistive device program um, and through uh, the ventilator equipment pool, which Mary will also discuss uh, a bit later. And um, through that program, uh, you can also get an annual grant um, that is also paid throughout the year that will help to pay to replace the supplies. Um, so just to give you an idea of the cost of the supplies, uh, again, this is here in Ontario, uh, depending on the vendor, because there's more than one vendor, it will vary between $200 to $400 just for your BiPAP mask. And the mask should be replaced on a yearly basis. Um, sometimes even a bit sooner um, than a full year because uh, they do wear out, especially if you're wearing it a lot. Um, there's also supplies for the machine itself. So the water chamber tubing and filters all need to be uh, taken care of and replaced. And you're looking at about 100 to 200 on a yearly basis. Um, but again, you would have uh, a bit of support from assistive devices program uh, to be able to pay for those um, supplies. And uh, now Kim will talk about the suction machine. Hi everyone. Um, so another piece of equipment we commonly see in the home with ALS patients is a suction machine. And this photo here just gives you an idea of what the setup looks like. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a quick second. Um, okay. Is anybody else having audio issues? We got a message about people not hearing Oh, someone, someone said yes, they are. Um, but we heard Stephanie right till the very end when you did the transfer over to Kim. Uh, can we hear, can you, can we hit, try, try again, to see if we can hear you, Kim? Can you hear me? Yeah, 
I can hear oh, they can hear you. Okay. Okay. So we're okay to continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, so going forward with the suction machine, a suction machine um, can be used for a couple different things. With ALS, like Stephanie was mentioning, um, sometimes the muscles in your jaw and uh, related to swallowing can weaken so that swallowing becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, so this can cause kind of your saliva to build up occasionally and can also cause some instances of choking if you're still eating uh, food. So a suction machine can be used to get rid of the excess saliva and help in the instances of choking. Um, the suction machines that we use in the community, like the picture we showed, they do have an internal battery, which is nice. So when that's charged, um, you're able to bring that with you um, and it is portable. And then it's also often used with the cough assist machine, which Mary is going to review in the next presentation. Um, just like a lot of the other equipment we're talking about today, there is a funding program for the suction unit. Um, so it is covered again under um, ADP and it needs to be prescribed by the physician. Um, so usually the respirologist will order it um, if it is needed and will go based on a recommendation frequently from the community RT, whether it's indicated or not. Um, to get funding for the suction machine, there's no testing required, and there's not any specific criteria that you have to meet. So it's not um, a very troublesome process to go through, which is nice. So in Ontario for the ADP coverage, again, they cover 75% of the cost of a unit, and they also have an annual grant of $180, which is split up into um, payments every three months, and that's going to cover your suction supplies. So things like the canister that you saw in the previous uh, picture and the tubing and all of that stuff that does have to be replaced every once in a while. So uh, the most common unit that we use uh, sells for $794. And with that ADP coverage, um, $198.50 is the cost for the patient. So they do cover a, a really big amount of that, which is great. Um, in terms of the supply cost, to give you an idea, uh, $40 every two months is kind of where you're sitting for that. A lot of the supplies for suction are reusable, which is nice. Um, and the better you take care of them, the, last or the longer they're going to last. The next piece of equipment we're going to talk about is the nebulizer. So here's two pictures of some of the models that we have. So on your left hand side, this is the Peritrek. Um, it's a portable unit and has a battery, which is nice. And then on the right hand side is a stationary nebulizer. So it does have to be plugged into the wall while you're using it. So what does a nebulizer do? So a nebulizer uh, is a device that turns liquid into a mist. So um, it can be used either with a mask or a mouthpiece, which is what was pictured in the, the previous slide. Um, oftentimes you're nebulizing saline or salt water, and this is gonna help to thin some of those secretions that you might be having some difficulty with and make it easier to suction or cough out. So nebulizers, again, are also covered under ADP. Um, if you're having trouble coughing up secretions because they're really thick, uh, your, or your respirologist can prescribe uh, one of these devices, and there's no extra testing needed for that. And then in Ontario, the portable one with a battery goes for about $430, and the stationary ones are cheaper at $146. Um, and again, they're covering 75% of that cost. Does anybody have any questions? We do have one question, um, and I think it's open to, to any of the three of you. Um, uh, is there things that people should be asking for when they're interacting with the respirologists or their RTs, either in hospital or in community, that they should say, I saw this and I sh I'm wondering, should I, should I get that? Or is that something that that would be recommended by the healthcare professionals if it was something they required? Both. I think I think people should be asking any question they have. 
um, but generally speaking, we will try to offer what they we think they need. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I think it's really important for you as a patient to always advocate for yourself and ask questions. Um, it, it's good to have all of the answers and just get as much information as you can. And if it's not something that you need at that point in time, then at least we can have that conversation um, when it is needed down the road. And my second question was around um, one of the comments that you made, Stephanie, um, was around the nose irritation. And I know that's a really big issue. I don't know, Mary Lynn, if we're going to go into that a little bit, but just, you know, that's something that's asked a lot of, from our community of how they deal with that. Yeah, so there's a lot of different masks, and I think there's a lot of people that don't know that. Um, sometimes they're given, you know, just one mask or a choice between one and two, and they think that's it. And that's not the case. Um, you know, everybody's face is different. Every mask is going to fit everybody differently. And so it's very important that if there is irritation, most commonly on the nose, sometimes it will be underneath the lip, um, that they do tell their vendor, their respiratory therapist, their doctor. Um, <clears throat> if ever um, they do start having some breakdown on the nose, um, you can do something as simple as just putting a piece of fabric in between the mask and the nose. Um, so um, there is, there's some supplies that you can buy a bit more expensive, but what I would recommend is sometimes, and that's what it's made out of, it's called a Remzi. It's just a very thin piece of fabric that you can put in between the mask and uh, the nose to help with that breakdown. Uh, but chances are, even if you do that, it will end up coming back. So definitely trying a different mask would be the answer. And do people require different masks at different times of the day? I do have patients that has a mask for when they're sleeping and a mask for when they use it during the day. So because their position is often different during the day compared to at night, or if, you know, the hybrid mask is very good because they can see, they can, you know, I have patients that will use their eyes to communicate and having something kind of in the way will, um, will be an issue for that. Um, so yes, it is definitely a possibility to have a mask of different frat night during and during the day. Great, thank you. Mary Lynn, we'll go over to you if that's okay. So I just need some instructions on how to share my screen. Oh, well, Stephanie shared hers, so do you have that little box that you have like your audio mm -hmm. um yeah okay so you'll see on the side a little round icon that has your mic then your video then a screen yep. Yep. if you click on that screen it just changes it from full screen to half screen you know what hold on one second and i'm going to switch you to a presenter. Ah, perfect. Show my screen. Perfect. Okay. And, and I apologize to everyone who's listening. It's been a while since I posted one of these, so I'm getting back into the form of it. Perfect. Okay. So Marilyn, Marilyn, we can see your screen now. Okay, perfect. Except we are on the wrong screen. Okay, perfect. Now I'll go into slideshow. All right, so um, as Kim said, uh, I'm one of the respiratory therapists. Uh, I work at the Ottawa Hospital in the CanVet department. Um, and we work, so what is our role here? I'm part of the clinic, so I work in the, in the clinic at the hospital. And um, our role here, our, our biggest role um, is, we have two main roles. One is testing and one is therapy. So first you're gonna come in, generally speaking, depending on availability and depending on your need, you will come to see us every three to six months. During that time, we are going to do a spirometry. That's the official name for the test where we tell you to take a big, big breath in and push it all the way out, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going until you have nothing left. We're also gonna do a peak cough flow 
Um, what that is, is you take a big breath in, we put a mask on your face and you cough into the machine and we measure how strong your cough is. We measure muscle strength. They're called MIPS and MEPS, which is maximum inspiratory pressure and maximum expiratory pressure. They are challenging. All of these tests that I've just mentioned are hard tests. They're maximum tests. They're challenging to do. And you guys are, all the patients try their best and do a great job, but they are tiring and they, they're hard. So they're hard to, they're physically hard to do. So we appreciate all of the effort that you guys do when you come to clinic. Um, an overnight oximetry, as Kim mentioned, uh, is something that we will often organize or sometimes a sleep study. Not as sleep studies are not as commonly organized. Um, and we will also do capillary or arterial blood gas monitoring. What that is, a capillary blood gas is we pick the end of the finger or toe and um, collect the blood and measure it. Uh, and or we can go into the artery and the most common place for that is on the inside of your wrist where you're going to check your pulse. So what, why do we do those? We do them to measure carbon dioxide. And I'm going to explain why that's important in a couple slides. Um, we also coordinate the delivery and setup of breathing and cough machines. Um, we'll coordinate with the healthcare people um, like Kim and Stephanie in the, um, in the community to have them set up in the community or set up here in clinic. We provide education to patients, family, and caregivers. And we are also part of the inter interdisciplinary ALS team here at the Ottawa Hospital. So one of the common questions is people ask, how does ALS affect my breathing? So ALS affects all, all the muscles of the body, and these are your respiratory muscles. So the inspiratory muscles on the left are the ones that are going to, that are going to bring the air into the lungs. And the ones on the left, the expiratory muscles, are the ones that, ex that help you exhale. Exhale is generally passive, but these muscles are mostly important because they help with your coughing. Coughing, blowing your nose, all of that. So what, what does it mean if you have weak respiratory muscles? Um, you will become short of breath, first with activity, um, and then sometimes even at rest, a lot of, so I just put in brackets dyspnea, just so you know that that's the term we often use here in hospital. It means short of breath. Um, and it'll mean that your cough won't be as effective. You're going to have to spend a whole bunch of energy trying to clear secretions if you end up with a chest infection, or you might have a hard time blowing your nose, which is, can be very uncomfortable to have blocked sinuses. Um, you'll have poor sleep. You're, you won't be able to lay flat. The reason you can't lay flat is because um, your muscles have to work harder in that position because they're fighting gravity to get air in, which causes you to wake up a lot. Bad sleep can lead to morning headaches, uh, not rested in the mornings. And also, um, I didn't put it on here, uh, but uh, frequent naps. Your day is interrupted because you have to nap because you didn't sleep well at night. And it may cause, and respiratory muscles can cause, uh, poor, poor respiratory muscles can influence your swallowing. So this is a breathing test. This is an example of, if you were to come to the Ottawa Kanban Clinic, this is exactly what your test would look like. What we do is we ask you your age, your height, your weight, and um, your gender. So what that does is it gives us right here our, our reference values, what we think a person of your age and gender and height should be. So these numbers here are the perfect 100%, but 80 to 120% of predicted is, um, is considered normal. Um, so, and here you'll see this particular man, um, he, his vital capacity, which is the number that we use, that we track all the time, um, in neuromuscular disease, such as ALS, we track the vital capacity. In respiratory diseases, such as emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, we check different numbers. So it's important to know that you're checking the vital capacity, your total volume. So this particular man was able to breathe in just under two liters, um, which is 50% of what a person of his age should be. 
So 50% is, is kind of, I use this one because this is, you'll see in the next slides, this is the, like the exact cutoff point that we are, that um, we look for. And it's actually gone up a little bit. It's usually higher. At 50%, we make recommendations. One of the recommendations we make is to start lung volume recruitment. And if you have, I'm going to show you a video of that later in a few minutes. But what that does is it, it helps put more volume into the lung so that you get a bigger breath. And so by doing that, we were able to increase this man's lung volume from two to 3.3 liters, which is super, which is very substantial. And by and also you'll see up here the peak cough flow we were able to increase as well. And here are the MIPS and MEPS we measured. If you, if you guys want me to go into that deeper, you can just add it to the chat and then they'll let me know. Um, but I, that's all I was going to talk about that right now. But please let me know if you want more detail on that. And this is these are the Canadian guidelines for ALS on how we're supposed to monitor you and what we do, what we're looking for and what we do, what our considerations are and what our interventions are. So this first monitoring is kind of, we talked, I talked about that's what that's what our role is, both as respiratory therapists in the home and in the hospital. And so what are we looking for? We're looking for symptoms of respiratory insufficiency. Um, orthopnea is a common word you're also going to hear. What that means is you are short of breath when laying flat. Um, the MIP, the maximum inspiratory pressure, how strong are those muscles to pull in? If they're less than 40 centimeters of water, um, or if your vital capacity is less than 65. So there are two guidelines that came out. The ones that came out in 20, it used to be the ones that came out before had said 50. And, um, but in 2020, they increased that to 65%. And that's when we would inter intervene. Or if it's eight, if your lung function is 80%, but you're having difficulty, shortness of breath, you're, you're short, um, you have a hard time laying flat without being short of breath. When we're doing the, um, the uh, blood tests, if your carbon dioxide is greater than 45%, 40, sorry, not percent, millimeters of mercury. And or if you have a nocturne, if your overnight asymmetry is um, is not is abnormal. Now you don't have to have all of these criteria. You need to have one, just one of these criteria. We are going to recommend a BiPAP. Um, NIV is non-invasive ventilation. So a BiPAP, so a mask. And then if anything gets worse, well then we are going to. Um, we're going to we're going to consider ventilation. We're going to talk about your care goals and decide what the next steps are. So this is for ventilation. Now, what about airway clearance, your cough, your ability to blow your nose? So we look at your peak cough flow if it's not efficient. And this is this is these are the, these are the guidelines. But truth be told, if you come into clinic and you tell me or doctor, one of the doctors that you are having a hard time clearing your secretions, we are going to try to help you because you don't want to spend a whole bunch of energy just coughing. You have so much other things to do during the day. You don't want to waste it all on coughing. So a non-effective cough. So a manually assisted cough is when it's almost it's very similar to a Heimlich you just um well here I'll show you I'll, I'll show you what it looks like
So that video, um, it did both. It showed you what lung volume recruitment is and a manually assisted cough. Um, and so the peak cough flow we talked about about the, the, key, the, the key number that we look at is 270 and then we intervene. But again, if you come in and tell us you're having a hard time, we're gonna, we're gonna address it. But the other thing with lung volume recruitment, that the lung volume recruitment is that bag where it's like a big breath in and big breath in and big breath in without exhaling so that you regain all of that volume that you have lost due to muscle weakness. But the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that we can do lung volume recruitment to blow your nose. Blowing your nose is like, I think it's a very important thing for comfort. So here's an example of an ALS patient who that's specifically what he was using it for. So that, uh, yeah, so it's, I think it's just, it's it, it, for him, it was very important for his comfort. And it's, uh, you can also do it with the cough assist machine. You just keep your mouth closed. This is an example of a patient who is on mouthpiece ventilation, which we will talk about in a bit, and who is also, who's using the cough assist machine. Cough assist is a trade name. You'll see in the video here, we're calling it mechanical insufflation exufflation, M-I-E. It's all the same thing. Cough assist is just the name of the machine that does it. And then the last technique for airway clearance, which is not as common in ALS, it's more common in other neuromuscular diseases, but it's still, it's still something that can be done. Um, it's called GPB or glossopharyngeal breathing, which we often refer to as um, frog breathing. Glossopharyngeal breathing. The goal of lung volume recruitment and glossopharyngeal breathing uh, um, is to increase the inhaled volume. And if we can do that, we can get a better cough out because a cough is a big breath in, your airway closes, your um, abdominal and uh, your respiratory muscles contract, build up pressure in your chest, your airway opens, and out you cough. If you have, if any of those processes are affected, it's going to, it's going to affect your cough. If you can't breathe in a big enough volume, you can't get secretions out if you can't get air behind them. If your abdominal muscles are too weak and can't generate that pressure, it's going to be really hard to get the volume out, to get the, the secretions out. 
And if you have what we call bulbar symptoms, where you have weakness in your jaw and face, um, it's going to affect your ability to control your vocal cords, to be able to close that off, to be able to exhale, to be able to cough properly. So for people who have good bulbar control, glossopharyngeal breathing or lung volume recruitment or breath stacking as it's also called, are, is, very, is very effective. But if you cannot, um, if you have a hard time with the, with the coughing, with the exhale generating that high pressure, then we do recommend a cough assist. Um, so I'm not, so we need to talk, so I want to talk about life support. I find a lot of our patients, um, jump right to that, right? You know, in the first visit, they think we're going to put them on life support straight away. What does life support mean in Ontario? I can't, I don't know what, and so the reason there, we have to define it. The government has to define what does that mean for individuals? So what it means in Ontario, you can cons you are considered to be on life support if you are using your breathing machine, either your BiPAP or your ventilator, for 12 hours a day or more. What does that mean? It means you need it more than you don't. So that is what we call life support. Nothing in our nothing that we do is necessarily going to change when we when we define you as being on life support. But what it does is it provides you with more services, uh, more, more equipment in the home to be able to, in the event that a machine malfunctions, well, we can get you, you'll have another one in the home that can work. Because if you can only go, if you, can, if you need it for 12 hours a day and you can only go for 12 hours without it, well, that's, it's pretty tough for us to be able to replace that machine in that period of time, which is why we would um, give you a second one in the home. And these devices, the cough, the lung volume recruitment is also provided by the assistive devices program, but uh, it's a different form than we would do for BiPAP or cough assist or ventilators. Um, so um, Stephanie already described the assistive devices program. Um, I'm just going to go into the ventilator equipment pool. So when you, um, if you have just straight sleep apnea, you are going to have your machines provided by companies like ProResp. Um, and they have all those machines there. But the BiPAPs with backup rate, the ventilators, those are considered machines that provide ventilation. Um, and they are supplied by the Ontario Ventilator Equipment Pool in Ontario, of course. So the VEP is a provincial service operated by Kingston Health Sciences Centre that provides life enhancing equipment and service to thousands of clients across, Can across Ontario and literally thousands. Um, it's funded by the Ministry of Health. Uh, the VP is the Central Provincial Depot of Ventilators and Related Equipment for persons of all ages who require these devices at home and who have been approved under the Ministry's Assistive Devices Program. Um, how do we provide ventilation? How do we provide support? So initially, um, uh, if going back to the previous screen, like if your vital capacity, if your lung volume is 65% or less predicted for a person of your age and height and gender, we are going to recommend BiPAP, which is non-invasive. So non-invasive ventilation, um, BiPAP at night, which um, I'm sorry, my screen just did something. Okay, so uh, BiPAP at night, it's provided with a mask. Ooh. No, I did that again, sorry. Let me just go back one, yeah. It's provided with a mask and we can use either a BiPAP machine or a ventilator. Once you um, are using that for more, for most of the, if you, oh boy, I'm so sorry, I'm so, okay. I'm not gonna touch my mouse anymore. Um, so once, uh, if you need help during the day, so BiPAP is at night. I want to, um, I want to help alleviate, uh, I want to take a lot of the workload away from your breathing muscles so that they can rest at night. When your legs are sore, you sit down. Maybe you'll put them up on an ottoman or on a chair or something. Your breathing muscles can't rest. They don't rest at night because you have to continue to breathe. The only way that we can really rest them is if I take a lot of that work away from you by using a BiPAP machine or a ventilator. 
Uh, but then during the day, you may, you, as the disease progresses, you may find that you're becoming more short of breath. And you're maybe having a harder time speaking full sentences, or you're having a harder time um, uh, calling for help, or even just, you know, not necessarily for help, but just uh, calling to someone else. So with mouthpiece ventilation um, during the day, we can help with that. And if you don't like mouthpiece ventilation, then you can also use your BiPAP machine during the day. Daytime ventilation is about comfort only. If it makes you feel better, then we use it. If you don't like it, then we don't. Um, so, and that's why some people will use mouthpiece, but then maybe in the evening when they're tired and they want to rest, but they don't want to go to bed, they may put their BiPAP mask on um, and watch a movie, watch the news, because then they don't have to think about it. And I'm going to show you, I, I have, I set up mouthpiece ventilation. I'll show you how it works. Um, and all of it, so the difference is BiPAP is not, um, uh, cannot provide mouthpiece ventilation. So you would need a ventilator for that. And, but both types of machines are available through the ventilator equipment pool. So why choose non-invasive ventilation? Um, you don't, there's no tracheostomy, you don't have a tracheostomy. Uh, you have a decreased risk of infections, reported increased quality of life, increased independence, improved speech volume, ability to do LVR, lung volume recruitment on your own, and it's much easier to stay in your own home. You can also choose to have invasive ventilation. There is a time where non-invasive ventilation uh, is not going to work anymore. So what does invasive ventilation mean? So non-invasive means there's nothing going into your body. Invasive means there is something going into your body. You are breathing from a tracheostomy. That is an airway that is in your throat. Uh, you have to use a ventilator for, for uh, tracheostomy ventilation. You cannot use a bi-level machine. The ventilator, there are some bi-level machines that say they will do it. Uh, in Ontario, the ventilator equipment pool does not have the um, equipment to be able to do this. And it's not, uh, it's not recommended in ALS at all. Um, and most often, uh, I'm, I'm speaking of Ottawa because that's where I am. Most often, uh, you will need to live in a long-term care facility. Uh, so why would you choose invasive ventilation? It does increase life expectancy in most cases. Um, when I say in most cases, I mean almost all, but there, there's always a percentage, right? Um, if you were able to speak prior to the tracheostomy, you will continue to be able to speak. We can put a speaking valve in line. Uh, you no longer have to adjust bi-level masks. You don't have to have anything on your face anymore. And alarms are often more sensitive than a BiPAP machine uh, is if, we set, if they're set properly. So these are, it's very important to have discussions prior to a crisis. Um, and it's very, they're very hard. It's very hard to have them because you know what, things are going well. And why do you want to talk about a crisis that's, you know, that's going to, that may or may not ever happen. It's depressing. And we make you do this and we're, we feel awful about that. But at the same time, we don't, we really don't want you to arrive in emerge in a crisis and not being able to understand what your options are. Um, and so discussions to have with your healthcare team, as well as your family, um, do you want a tracheostomy? Is that something, is that in your goals of care? First, and, and goals of care on the day of diagnosis versus, you know, six months, a year, two years in, you can change your goals of care. You know, that, we see that all the time. But you need to know what your answer is for today in the event of a crisis. Um, and if you do want to tracheostomy, how long do you want to be on a breathing machine? Um, do you want, for some people, it's I want, to, I want to see my grandchild born. I want to see my child graduate from high school. I want to, I want to go, I want to stay on till Christmas. Or I want to stay on for as long as I possibly can. That is, all of those answers are okay. But this is also a discussion you want to have. The reason is the reason that we as respiratory therapists, respirologists, you know, your ALS team, 
really find it is very important for you to have this dis this discussion is because in ALS, unfortunately, one of the things that can happen is you can become what we call locked in. Locked in means your brain is functioning and you are able to understand what is going on around you, but you were not able to communicate to us. Um, and that, that, that will happen. That has happened in ALS. So, um, so just to, so a lot of people will choose to discontinue ventilation prior to being locked in. Um, and one of the questions was, how do we discontinue ventilation? We can so we discontinue invasive and non-invasive ventilation pretty much the same way. We will wean the ventilation, and then your palliative physician. It, it's done with palliate with the palliative physician or whoever your physician, your end of life physician is. We will increase. We will provide you. They will provide you with medication to make you not be short of breath and be comfortable as we wean the ventilation to off. It is not um, when when planned. It is not something that is um, traumatic or scary. It's it's um, it's important to have to have a plan, and your team will definitely do this with you. Absolutely, without any doubt, they will help you with that. Now, my last point is oxygen. How I can't tell you how many times people have asked me. Uh, what about oxygen? Can I have, should I have oxygen? People associate shortness of breath with a need for oxygen. And that's not true. Um, a shortness of breath means you are having a, in ALS, you are having a hard time getting the volume in. You're, unless you had a pre-existing respiratory condition, um, such as emphysema, COPD, um, you will, there's no reason that the oxygen should not be able to cross into the blood and be able to supply your body. If your oxygen levels are low, then it means you're not breathing in a big enough volume. And often a low oxygen level in ALS is a secondary sign to high carbon dioxide. So we want to, and how, so how do we treat shortness of breath in ALS? We give you more volume. We give you more BiPAP. We give you mouthpiece ventilation. Um, we increase your settings. And then if we're able to get the carbon dioxide down to a normal level, your oxygen should also normalize. So oxygen does play a role in palliative medicine, absolutely. And that's to be discussed. You can discuss that with your respirologist, your palliative physician, um, and your respiratory therapist. So these are, these are some links. Um, so CANVENT, that's us, the Ottawa Hospital. This is our website. And in here, the, and this is where the videos were from. In here, whether you're a patient or a caregiver, by, the time, by this point, you guys are all health professionals. Because the presentations are pretty, are, I believe, are actually even exactly the same. So you go to health professionals. This video here is really great. It's, um, it's a 25 minute video with Dr. McKim and an ALS patient discussing, and it's, it's a mock first visit appointment with your respirologist. And we recommend for, all, for our patients to all watch that before they see doc, our, our, our respirologist in, in Ottawa is Dr. Uh, Doug McKim before they see him. Um, and also on that website, if you go to phase, whoops. So phase two is at risk of respiratory complications. And this is where you have your manually assisted cough and it explains it in great detail and gives, um, gives a lot of information and more slides and more pictures. And then in phase three, respiratory failure, signs of progression. And then here we have non-invasive ventilation, how we initiate it and how we initiate daytime mouthpiece ventilation. And so these, it's just a great place to go for information. The ventilator equipment pool website, I just found out this week that they're changing their, their, the, the ventilator, the, pardon me, they're changing the website and it's gonna be even better. I think it's fantastic though. If you go into resources and you go to videos, they, 
they give you, they show you exactly how to set it up, how to use it, what, and for everything, all the way from the, sorry, from your regular BiPAP to the cough assist and, um, uh, and the ventilator. And there's a whole, oh, yeah. So, and then also, this is a caregiver guide to respiratory care. This is the one that we have in the Champlain Lynn. And this is something that we that the patients are given by um, by the Somerset West is the one who operates it. And there's just a lot of great information in here as well. And I'm done. That's it. So now I need to stop sharing my screen. Perfect. And we do have some questions coming in. And I do apologize for how fast I speak. That is something that people can see your screen. No one can perfect. see your screen. How's that? Is that better? Great. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to start because I know that um, you're also going to do a little bit um, of the display and share. So I'm going to put some questions out first and then give people an opportunity to write some more into the box. Um, so the first question was, um, is the BiPAP machine portable? So yes and no. Um, it is portable without any water. So it is not portable with water in the humidifier. Um, but in, in Ontario, the, you will be, uh, ALS patients are given the Stellar 150. That may change because there's new machines coming up. But today, it's the Stellar 150. And the humidifier is actually removable. So the BiPAP itself is not very big. You can attach your tubing directly to it. It's great for car drive, for car trips and going to appointments and stuff like that. But it is a little bit more drying because you don't have the humidifier. It's, and it has a three hour battery. Uh, the next question was about um, the cough assist. How do you know when to increase the settings and whether or not the person is on the right setting? So um, we, once we find, so initially when you first, we first do it, and I can do a demonstration of it, it's pretty aggressive. It's it's not something that, um, like I, I just tell everybody, I'm like, this is going to feel weird. It's not going to hurt, but it's going to feel weird. And uh, sometimes we send them, when we send them out, we unfortunately will send them out on maybe suboptimal settings while they're getting used to it. But we try it within the week or within two weeks to increase the settings to what we call therapeutic settings because if we set it too low then it's just not going to work so it may be uncomfortable but it'll be uncomfortable for five minutes but it's not going to hurt it's just going to feel weird and you're because what's happening is we're stretching all of your inspiratory muscles that we're not that are used to being stretched and so you're getting that huge breath in uh, but if it's set too low, it doesn't work. And then, it, then you, instead of it being a five-minute treatment, it's like a thirty-minute treatment. That's that's how I practice. Uh, Kim, Stephanie, what do you think? Uh, yeah, Kim might have a bit more experience, but yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what we do. We often, yeah, if we get in the home and the settings are a bit too much, we know right away. And yeah, for comfort and 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 to increase compliance, we'll make it a bit more comfortable to start and move up as quickly as possible to uh, the optimal setting. So like Mary said, if it takes a very long time to get where you want to, um, and it's very hard to uh, bring anything up, then yeah, that might be an indication that the settings are not optimal for you. The next question actually, um, and maybe Stephanie and Kim, you can answer this one, was um, about finding somebody in the Toronto area. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, obviously being connected to ProRest, there is a ProRest in Toronto. Um, so I think in terms of that question uh, to the person who asked it, um, if you're connected to an ALS clinic out of Toronto, there is a respiratory therapist there, but they also, if you require home services, uh, they have a fee for service, but they can connect you with the ProResp in Toronto directly to make that connection. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, perfect. So if you're not connected with that, please, if you're not connected with an ALS clinic specifically out of Toronto, 
you can also then just look up ProResp online and they will be able to connect you with um, someone who is quite familiar with ALS. Uh, exactly and at least get some information where they can then uh, loop in the doctor and with the doctor then if home care therapy is needed uh, yeah then we can definitely assist. Um, Mary Lynn one of the things um, that one of the questions that was asked was a bit more of an explanation on the uh, test that you showed so you said you'd go into a bit more detail someone did ask a little yeah. bit more detail and I think that comes out of um, a lot of times people will want to know numbers. They're very number focused. Mm -hmm. And so when a client does a, a test, they say, well, what's my number? So they have something to judge it on every single time. Not necessarily being symptomatic, but that's something that they tend to focus on. So maybe if we could go a little bit into a tiny bit more detail onto that, what that means, what some of those numbers mean. Yep. So the most important number is your vital capacity, uh, VC or FVC, S. So FVC is forced vital capacity, SVC is slow vital capacity. That's really important if you have lung disease in neuromuscular, we just want to measure the volume. I'm going to do whatever test I can do to get the best volume out of you. So one of the things, and I'm glad someone asked this because I meant I'd written myself a note to talk about this and then I completely forgot. One of the things that's important when you're looking at your number, you're going to look online. I can tell you what you're going to find online. Online, you're gonna, it's going to say 65, uh, 80% uh, with symptoms, we're getting a bypass. 65% um, without symptoms, you're getting a bypass. Uh, uh, and um, if you're peak cough flow, if your cough is less than 270, we're going to talk about either lung volume recruitment or a cough assist machine. So these are these are percent of, in Ottawa, 30% for a feeding tube. Your lung function has to be at 30% in order to have outpatient uh, services for a feeding tube. So those are kind of like the big landmarks that we look at. Uh, but So it's important, it's good to know what your number is, what is the change and that's why we try to get you in for breathing tests as soon as we can because I want to know what your baseline is. Maybe you are someone who is normally 120%. So if you come and see me your first appointment, you're 120%, but then your next appointment, you're 80%, you're still considered in the normal range, but due to the fact that there's a significant drop, we are gonna, we're going to look at that differently. So it's important to get that breathing test done well, and I don't mean like the first week, but ne but quickly enough so that we can get a good baseline. And one thing that's important to note to mention is if you happen to be going to different centers to be doing your breathing tests. For example, we have patients here in Ottawa who go to Montreal for different types of studies. So you want to make sure that you're equating apples to apples. So we you know, you have, we have a, what we call predicted based on your age, height, gender. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of different scientists who have studied this and have decided this is what's normal. So your, your person, so 80% here might be 70% in Montreal or vice versa. So if you're going between labs, know your actual value. Is it two liters? Is it two and a half liters? And that way you'll know if there's a if there's a change. And ask your respiratory therapist, what does this mean? Okay, I dropped 10%. What does that mean? Sometimes it means nothing. Sometimes it means we're just going to watch you for another couple months and we're going to have maybe have you come back in instead of pushing you off to the six months, I'll maybe want you to come back in in three months. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but ask it again if it's if it wasn't clear. No, I think that I think that's a great um, response. And I think reiterating just if you're not sure what that means and you and people all have access to online uh you know when they go to the hospital now they can see what tests they've had done and then they're trying to interpret those tests so i think it's important if you have questions that you ask so that you know so that you're well informed on your decision making so uh, me, sorry, i forgot about the i should probably add what if interpreted once interpreted by a respirologist you are going to be told that you have restrictive lung disease all that means is your lungs are it's harder to inflate them it's it, your your muscles are kind of hindering your the inflating them it doesn't actually mean that you have lung disease it's just that's how it's interpreted 
for people to know. So I, I was wondering if you, one of the big things that everybody is looking forward to seeing is what does the equipment actually look like? I know we've showed a lot of pictures and things. It's hard for people to get a really big sense of how much space does this take up? What does this look like? So if you would be willing to show us a few of your show and tell items, it would be much appreciated. Yeah. Um... I don't think you have to do anything different. Oh yeah, because people oh. can see me. Yeah. That's right, they don't want to see my screen. Check. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> this, is, um, the, this is the Trilogy ventilator. This is the ventilator that's currently being provided by the ventilator equipment pool. Um, there is another one called the Astro, but it is barely out in um, circulation yet. So it's very similar. The, the, the function is quite similar. The Astro is like, maybe a little bit skinnier, but longer. So, but this is, and this is the stand that it, you can get it on. And that's how big it is. Whoop, I'm going the wrong way. The reason you would like to have it on a stand is because then you can take it from the bedroom to the living room, to the kitchen, um, or you can just, um, or it'll come off the stand like this. And you can put it in a bag and hang it off the back of your wheelchair or sit it on the floor beside your recliner, whatever you like. So right now it's set up in mouthpiece ventilation. So this is what it looks like. We have a circuit, filter, filter is very important, always have a filter, especially with the trilogy. And you have your circuit, another filter here, and a mouthpiece. So all you do is you you just suck on it like a pipe. And it doesn't, it takes very little, actually that, that's pretty, probably pretty low, but um, I was going to say the settings are a bit too low for me, but um, all it does is you just, all you have to do is tap the end of it with your tongue and it's going to deliver a breath. So what it does, it just gives you that nice big breath that you're craving. Or you can um, take a couple of breaths and yell. <coughs> And you can also breath stack with it by yourself. So you, it looks like this. <laughs> and you cough. So I'm actually um, one. This that's another reason. That's an, that's actually increases your independence as well with the mouthpiece ventilation to be able to get that big breath in and get a cough. Like I had a lady who was who was not comfortable being alone because she needed someone to use the lung volume recruitment bag with her to clear secretions. But then once she needed her the this, she was like, I'm fine to stay home by myself because I if I need to cough, I'll be able to. I'm not scared of choking anymore. So it'll also do that. So then how do I turn this into a bypass? Because so you take off this. So this is during the day. Now it's time to go to bed. Or you want to have a nap, whatever. First, you turn it off. You switch this. You attach a tubing here. This is the humidifier. And then it goes to your BiPAP mask. And then you go to sleep. And then you get up. You switch that off and you attach this tubing for mouthpiece. I do actually, that's another thing I do want to comment. I want to add to what Stephanie said um, that the mask lasts about a year, but if you use it more, you're going to need to replace it more. So, and it's true, like I have seen patients who need to replace it sometimes up to every four months if they're using it most of the day. So, just to but an uncomfortable BiPAP mask is not worth it. It is worth replacing it and getting a comfortable mask. The success, I can't stress enough that success of BiPAP therapy is in the mask. I can do a whole bunch of things with the settings, but if that mask is not comfortable, it's just not gonna work. And um, most always your respiratory therapists in the community, are, and I'm speaking for myself, are the specialists when it comes to the masks. We don't have access to masks. We don't have that, you know, they are the ones to go to for that because they have 
and they have the, they have more training than I do in that area as well, because that is not my specialty. Um, and then the cop assist machine. I want to make a, a quick point that if your BIPOC does not look directly like hers, you don't need to have a panic attack and say you have the wrong <laughs> one, because I. I feel like that might be one of the first things that we get phone calls on after is we watched this and ours didn't look exactly like that. So like you mentioned, there's different brands, different versions. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have the one that you need. It's not necessarily the same as what she's showing. So. And the other thing is, is the, there are BiPAPs that are available without a battery backup and the ventilator equipment pool will not supply those to ALS patients. They don't supply it to anybody with a progressive uh, neuromuscular disease uh, because there's no battery. So in the event of a power failure, you need a battery. You know, even if it's only two or three hours, you just need something. And then this is the cough assist machine. So almost never will it be on a stand. We have, we at the hospital, we put everything on a stand because things grow legs and walk away. It's a lot harder to put this in your car and not be noticed. But, um, and you don't want to stand. They're not that heavy. It's easy to take from your bedroom to the living room, to the kitchen, to the car. If you had it on a stand and it doesn't come, if, when it's on a stand, it's on like for good. Like you have to take a screwdriver out to take it off. That's not something that I recommend to our patients because I want it to be portable. So you turn it on. So they showed you a video of what the patient looked like, but they didn't really show you how easy the machine is to operate. When this, this is the this is the, our machine, but this is the machine that will be supplied by the ventilator equipment pool. We are going to do a whole bunch of button pushing and everything and all of that when we get you set up. We're going to start you really low, and then we're gradually going to work your way up, work up to the level we want you at. But we don't want you to be scared by it. We don't want you to be overwhelmed. So we start low. And, but when you get at home, this is all you have to do. So you have to turn it on, you put the mask on, you press therapy, and then stop. So it's as simple as this. And you do that three or four times until your secretion is clear. Best times to do it are uh, first thing in the morning because you're changing your gravity position. Your, your center of gravity is changing. You may have something you may need to cough. And we do recommend before meals, especially when you're first learning, because you're going to swallow some air. And then you're going to burp, and it's going to be uncomfortable. As you get good at it, you can do it any time of day. Um, that's great. Thank you. I, I know that there is definitely people on this call who are very happy to see what these look like because a lot of it is in different terminology and there's a lot of things that are short formed. Yeah. And there is a lot of things that people don't, you know, especially when you're newly diagnosed and you're trying to wrap your head around all these things, they're not, no one is in the technical world to have a good understanding of what all of these things mean. So, um, I think uh, our, we're, now I'm just getting comments saying, saying thank you so much. So I don't think we're getting any more questions, but I am getting a lot of feedback from uh, participants saying thank you so much to all three of you. Uh, I'm even getting text messages saying this is great. Thank you, um, which is awesome. So I want to say thank you to the three of you for taking your time today. Uh, I know we started off with some technical difficulties, but I do appreciate that you all hung in and to all the attendees who, for hanging in as well. Um, we are going to be posting this on um, the ALS Kennedy YouTube channel for more people to have access to it. Um, but I want to say thank you again to the three of you for taking your time today to share all of your great information. Oh, I do have one quick question, even though people are saying goodbye. Um, can I use a cough machine, cough assist to help blow your nose? I think yeah. that was one of the videos that you shared. So well, what, that was with the lung volume recruitment thing. Which was this, which is this, but yes, yeah, so if you're using it, uh, the cough assist to blow your nose, you take, you, you, on the inhale, you fill up your lungs, but then when it switches to exhale, 
then you keep your mouth closed so the air is going to come out your nose Great. and then it'll help clear it so then and you just have to clean your mask out with a with paper towels or face cloths in between and yeah wonderful what i'm what i um what i just did is actually put the email address to our team in chat uh community services at als.ca and then if people have follow-up questions uh, I will reach out to the three of you to make sure they're connected with the right people. If you are not in the Ottawa Kingston area, we will absolutely make sure you're connected with an RT anywhere in Ontario, um, either through a hospital or through the private clinics and make sure that you have the right support you need. So um, obviously people are still thinking of things as we're kind of like wrapping up. So I don't want people to miss that opportunity. So I would say just reach out to us and we will happily point you in the right direction. So. Wonderful. I do want to make one comment just based for the ventilator equipment pool. The machines provided by them are loans. They do need to be returned if you're not going to use them or you no longer need them. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Kim, Stephanie, and Mary Lynn for your time today. Thank you to the audience for your, your great engagement and participation. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.